me turn to issues of data collection, I want to spend a few minutes talking about design decisions. Now, for some evaluations, design decisions are not as prominent. We're told from the start how we're going to design the evaluation. But in other cases, we have quite a bit of autonomy, and so it becomes very important to decide what's the appropriate design for the evaluation. Right? While this is related to issues of how do we collect the data and how do we analyze the data, it really precedes it and sort of is a meta level above it. Like everything else we do in our framework, design choices rely on the standards. And as you've already seen in the other discussions of setting an evaluation focus, of all these standards, utility and feasibility are probably the prime ones. Utility is especially key, what's the purpose of the evaluation and who's going to use the results and for what purpose. Okay. And we'd already seen earlier, there are many, many different purposes for an evaluation. Sometimes it's for accountability. Sometimes it's proved success or failure of the program. In other cases, it might be just trying to figure out if we could implement the program with fidelity. When the purpose is proof of causation, then design becomes an especially important decision because it raises a lot of very complex issues that are both time-consuming and expensive. So you always want to ask yourself, is proof a primary purpose of this evaluation? And with what level of rigor do I need to prove causation or causal attribution? These are the requirements of what's called an experimental model. And of the three types of evaluation designs, experimental models are the ones that come closest to answering this question of causal attribution. Now, again, I want to emphasize not all evaluations are about proving cause. But when they are, the experimental model represents sort of the highest and best standard. We'll see in a few minutes that there's some trade-offs in, in getting, being certain about causal attribution. But first, let me walk through what the requirements are for an experimental model. So an experimental model assumes that you have two conditions, an experimental condition and a control condition. So there are two groups. And they differ because one gets something that the other one doesn't. It doesn't mean that the control group gets nothing. It simply means that they don't get this experimental thing that we're trying to measure the efficacy of. There's a single experimental condition. doesn't mean that you're only doing one thing, but that you can name with certainty what that specific difference is between the treatment of the experimental folks and the treatment of the folks in, the, in the, what are called the control conditions. The third one is probably the most prominent and the hardest one to do in the field, and that is random assignment to conditions. In a true experimental model, the chances that any one individual would be assigned to the experimental condition or the control condition should be the same. It should be random. And then finally, pre and post program measurement. We'll see a little bit later that this is the one that's most easily sacrificed and can still retain the power of an experimental design. But in an ideal world, at a minimum, you're taking measures from people in both the experimental and control condition, and you're looking at it before the program begins and then again after the program begins on one or two or more occasions after the program has been underway. Now, if these are the highest and best use uh, and requirements of experimental condition, then what is it that we lose and what is it that gets compromised when we step back from these? When we think about types of designs, and particularly in the context of an evaluation where the purpose is proving causation, or what we call causal attribution, then the continuum of evaluation designs is quite straightforward. Experimental design is the strongest, and we'll talk in a second about the four requirements of experimental design. Quasi-experimental design compromises some of those requirements, but is still a strong design. And then non-experimental design, for purposes of proving causation, is a fairly weak design. But again, we want to emphasize these three designs may be entirely appropriate for specific evaluation at a specific time, when the purpose of the evaluation is primarily to prove cause, or what we call causal attribution, then this is the order generally in which you want to proceed. If you can pull off experimental design and it's appropriate, great. If not, you're always going to look next for, can I pull off a quasi-experimental design? And in fact, you're going to ask yourself, is there some non-experimental design approach I can use that will still get at some of the fundamental elements of cause? When we get rid of randomization, as I said, that's often the hardest thing to do in an applied setting. What we let in is the potential for selection bias. If I don't know that the chances someone is in the experimental or control condition are equal, then there's always a chance that the folk who chose the one condition or another have some attribute in common that's related to the outcome of interest. So my, one of my first jobs here at CDC, I taught a stand-up evaluation course across the hallway. By sheer coincidence, there was someone teaching a six-week uh, online evaluation course over the TV. 
right? People self-selected into my course or that course. At the end, we, we could determine and decided to look at who learned more evaluation. We may find that my course worked better or the TV course worked better. We would not know with certainty that it was the nature of the teaching. It could have been something self-selected about the people who decided they prefer stand-up training or the people who prefer the TV training. So that's a good example where randomization gets rid of selection bias, all the characteristics of participants that might be causing the outcome of interest. The control group, when we get rid of a control group, what we do is we let in confounders and secular factors. Okay? Now in, in evaluator parlance, I can, have a compar I can have a group out there that's not randomly assigned, and while it's not a pure control group, we still call it a comparison group, and still it adds a little bit of power. But when I can't have a pure control group or even a comparison group, then what I let in are confounders and secular factors. If, in fact, there's a difference between my uh, experimental condition and my control condition, I don't know if it's due to the intervention or because of something else going on outside. Way, way long ago, I did a project on intimate partner violence, and we were trying to measure whether a communication campaign in the community changed the perception of people about domestic partner violence and its causes and its solutions. Well, about a week before we did our post-test, uh, the OJ case broke with the media. And of course, everybody in the nation learned so much more about intimate partner violence and domestic violence than they knew even a week before. Had we not had control communities in that case, it would have been very hard for us to say it's our communication campaign that caused the difference in the community's perception of intimate partner violence. Now. This issue of experimental, uh, experimental design as the quote-unquote gold standard is probably one of the most controversial and acrimonious discussions that go on in the evaluation community. And for every person who says experimental design is the gold standard, there's someone else who will retort, yes, but sometimes it's fool's gold. Now, why would someone not endorse these obviously beneficial four requirements for an experimental design? Right? The first reason is what we call the trade-off between internal validity and external validity. When the issue at hand is I want to prove with certainty that my intervention was causing this result and not something else, then experimental design is really key. And it's really, it's really the most appropriate approach because it isolates out the causes of my cause from any other cause. What you lose in the process so often, though, is what we call external validity. You end up simplifying the intervention so much, you end up simplifying the situation so much that the ability to make generalizable statements of when this intervention would work and in what settings becomes very compromised. Now, unfortunately, as evaluators, our goal is always to improve a situation. And so if all we've learned is that a very simplified intervention tends to work in the lab, it may be of little utility to us when we're out there in the field trying to find solutions to problems. The second issue that often makes it fool's gold, i.e., uh, not the most appropriate choice, is when we're dealing with wide, uh, multifaceted, and wide community interventions. By design, those community interventions are multifaceted for a reason. And trying to find a control group for, say, a community approach to diabetes becomes very hard. You're talking about issues where there's always something going on in a community. And so to try and find a true control community for a multifaceted diabetes intervention becomes hard. And if we could find such a community, often we'd have to simplify the examination of the intervention so much we would have lost the power of this sort of multifaceted or coalition approach. So in conclusion, the evaluation community has said sometimes experimental model is exactly the right thing to do. Sometimes it's the exactly right thing to do, but we can't do it because it's hard to implement. But there are other cases where even if it was easy to implement, it would be the wrong thing to do. It would lead us to erroneous conclusions or oversimplified conclusions. So here's a couple quotes of interest from, uh, from uh, some authorities on this. So the first is the WHO European Working Group on Health Promotion. And they conclude that the use of randomized control trials, that's another name for experimental designs in the field, to evaluate health promotion is, in most cases, inappropriate, misleading, and unnecessarily expensive. That's a fairly dire and extreme statement. But coming from the WHO Working Group on Health, you can see the point behind their point that when we're dealing with things in the community, often we have to so simplify when we use experimental design that we just lose that external validity. Uh, GAO said in November 2009, requiring evidence from randomized studies as sole proof of effectiveness will exclude many potentially effective and worthwhile practices. 
Okay. So it's another big issue. When we're dealing with stuff in the field, it's so seldom we can really mimic experimental design and its requirements, even when it's the best approach, that you hate to throw out really good potential approaches because we can't hit on all four cylinders of experimental design. So GAO says, look, there are other ways of thinking about cause and causal attribution when you can't meet the requirements of experimental design or it's not the appropriate approach. So what are those? Oh, for, I'm sorry. First, here's a, and here's my most uh, my favorite one, which is uh, from uh, the British Medical Journal, and it's a tongue-in-cheek study of, uh, of parachutes. And it concludes that parachutes reduce the risk of injury after a gravitational challenge, but their effectiveness has not been proved with randomized control trial. Again, the tongue-in-cheek point here: there are phenomena for which experimental design we could really do it if we needed to, but it isn't the most appropriate approach. It isn't the logical approach to use. So if we really do worry about cause, and cause is really on the table as a purpose, then how do we get at it if we don't use experimental design? Well, some other ways that we would justify that it's our intervention, and particularly out in the field where life is complex, one is proximity and time. Right? If I do time series analyses or other approaches, I notice that prior to the intervention, uh, I saw this sort, of, this sort of outcome, and it was heading in this direction. After the intervention, I saw a change in direction or a change in intensity. Then I have some circumstantial evidence, at least, that my intervention is having an effect. Coupled with the second bullet, this is often a powerful way to make a case for cause when experimental design is either impossible or not the appropriate approach. That is, when I look around, what else could be explaining what's going on? Now, in the case of youth obesity, there are often thousands and thousands of interventions going on in a large community. And so accounting for alternative explanations could be very hard. But in other cases, like infectious diseases, people in public health may be the only act in town and the only ones really operating. And so if I see changes in perceptions or attitudes or actions related to something like tuberculosis or sexually transmitted diseases, I can look around and determine that, look, this is the only thing going on. There's not some big secular campaign going on. And have some reasonable certainty that my intervention is responsible for the change. Thirdly, and especially at CDC, where we often give money to lots and lots of grantees to do something similar, when we look across those grantees and across their contexts, and we find that whenever contexts are similar, we're seeing similar effects, that lends some credence to our desire to demonstrate that it's our intervention that's working the magic. And then finally, and most relevant to some of the things we've learned in this tutorial series, is what we call plausible mechanisms or program theory. In program theory, what we say is we do this intervention and we name with certainty what the expected chain of outcomes is. Well, if we can show through some focused studies that every chain in that outcome chain is occurring, then we have some reasonable certainty to say our intervention is making at least a contribution to those latest or most downstream outcomes. So for example here, in program theory, if I can prove with some study that A is causing B, and B is causing C, and C is causing D, then I can say with at least, and at least in a circumstantial, and even a more than circumstantial fashion, that A is making some kind of contribution to D. So if I'm doing a big training geared to providers, and I can prove that that changes provider knowledge, attitude, and belief about who to screen and when to screen, and I can also prove that the changing attitudes of providers have been responsible for changing standards of practice in the profession. And I can also prove that changing standards of practice in the profession are a main cause that's been codified in some sort of statewide policy. Then I think I can say with near certainty that my initial training of providers made at least a contribution to that big supportive change in the policy environment. In short, the right design choice, like everything else we do in evaluation, depends. There's no one thing called the right design. The purpose, the user, and the use are key, just as they are in every other decision we make at this focus step. And the other standards are also going to play a role. There are cases where experimental design is completely feasible, but for accuracy and propriety purposes, we wouldn't use it. Just as often, there are cases where experimental design makes a lot of sense from a purpose user use perspective, but from a feasibility point of view, we simply don't have the time, skill, or the resources to pull it off, and we have to look for an alternative way to demonstrate cause. Again, the key point I want to leave you with is cause is not always the purpose for our evaluations, 
when cause is the purpose for our evaluations, there are many ways of demonstrating causal attribution. In some cases, experimental design is absolutely the best way and it's the most feasible way. In other cases, experimental design is the absolutely right way to do it, but very infeasible or hard to implement. And there are still other cases where experimental design actually might lead us in the wrong direction.